Well, we're coming to the end, sadly, of our series of Tropical Talks. And today we're focusing on the Cotswolds and Andy Parsons is the chief executive of the Cotswold National Landscape, which is a bit of a mouthful, but they're based at the old prison at North Leach and Andy joins us now. Hi there, Andy. Hi, Mike. Nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you as well. So, yeah, a bit cheeky, that bit of a mouthful. So perhaps you can sort of give us a thumbnail sketch of what, what actually is the Cotswold National Landscape. Well, I, I'm actually pleased. You said it's a bit of a mouthful because uh, from my point of view, Mark, it's a, it's a huge improvement. So okay. uh, the, 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 the term national landscape uh, came about in the in the Glover Review, uh, which was published back in 2019, looking at all national parks and areas of outstanding natural beauty or AONB or ANOB or rearrange those four letters however you would like to. <laughs> Uh, and one of Glover's clear recommendations from that review was, was that actually no one really understands, or a lot of the public don't understand what an AONB is. But yeah. his recommendation, Mark, was to, to rebrand, and it is a rebrand, let's be clear on that, the legal designation is still an area of outstanding natural beauty, at least for the time being, to rebrand to national landscapes. You have a family of national parks, Mark, and a family of national landscapes. And, uh, and we, as the Cotswolds, uh, decided not to wait for, for government to respond to the Global Review and make a recommendation, but actually to speak to DEFRA and, and speak to other AOMBs and actually put our hands up to be a pilot for this thing. So, so back in, it was just over a year ago now, September 2020, which marked the anniversary of the Global Review, we, we made the change. Our board members supported it and we changed from... Cotswolds AOMB as a public facing name to the national landscape. And I have to say it's gone down brilliantly with at a local level as well. So the benefit is, uh, you know, part of, um, uh, you haven't reorganized anything, you're still doing the same thing. It's just a uh, tying in with all the other areas of yeah, what, what's really What we're really looking to do is, is uh, demonstrate the value of the name change at a national level, because undoubtedly, over the coming months and years, there will be a shift towards looking at renaming and rebranding all other 33 areas of outstanding natural beauty. For me, the important thing is that people can, can get the name, you know, it's national, which, which for me is a sense of it's for everyone. Whereas, yeah. you know, AONB, is that a place I can visit? I don't know, is it just conserved? So therefore I can't go there. And it's a little bit confusing. So, so we've been really pleased with the with the name change. It, it's certainly gone down really well here. Okay, let's um, rattle through a few uh, basic points, Cami. So, just how what are we talking about here in terms of size? So, how big is is the national landscape? Yeah, it's scarily big. It's uh, it's seven hundred and ninety <laughs> square miles, so over two thousand square kilometers. So, so of the forty four national parks and AOMBs. Only the Lake District and the Yorkshire Dales is larger in size than the Cotswolds. So we wow. cover six counties. We cover 15 local authority, a blend of first tier and second tier local authority boundaries. So, you know, down to Bath, up to just about touching the M40 in Warwickshire. So it, it, covers, it covers a massive area, Mark. OK, and in terms of um, budget and employees, when yeah, so, 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 so budget-wise, uh, we it's, it's, there's a lot of change going on at the moment. So I'll try and when I, I joined as chief executive in in December 2019, we had a team of 14 people, and we had a budget of around give or take a million pounds a year. We are now going when we recruit a couple of uh, most recent roles. And I, I might talk about one of those a bit later. We'll be up to a team of 23 people mm -hmm. uh, with a budget of over two million. Uh, the, the budget comes from uh, DEFRA, from central government, uh, uh, about just under half of the, the 1 million is DEFRA funding. The local authorities all financially contribute to the Cotswolds and national landscape. And, and one of the main reasons for that is that we have one of our statutory duties is to write the periodic management plan for the Cotswolds. And if we didn't exist, there would be effectively 15 versions of that management plan. So, so we are tasked with doing that and we do that in extensive stakeholder um consultation uh, and the next management plan is due in 23 so we're just starting that process now the reason for the increase in funding is, is a number of things really uh, the main one being that there is a, a new program a grants program for farmers and land managers across all protected landscapes called farming in protected landscapes it's in the agricultural transition plan we we are looking at or therefore are looking at that bridge between uh, now and 2024 when environmental land management kicks into place fully 
So all protected landscapes have got some funding to work with farmers and land managers and to, uh, to give out grants to support their work and, and to offset, not entirely clearly, but offset some of that loss of basic payment schemes over the next couple of years. Really interestingly, there's four key themes to that, to the grants, and that's uh, nature, climate, people and place, which, which talks about the special qualities of the AOMD. So, so we've got a new team in place, farming and protected landscapes. Some of the other reasons for the growth is, um, although, you know, Glover said AOMBs are significantly underfunded. Yes, we are. Uh, give you, give you, just to give you a bit of a stat on that, our funding from central government across 34 AOMBs is just under six, just shy of six million pounds a year. The newest national park, uh, South Downs, their budget is around about 11 million pounds a year from DEFRA or their funding. So if you think one national park, 11 million ish, uh, yeah. 34 yeah. AOMBs under 6 million. Now, don't get me wrong, national parks have, have other duties that we don't, such as planning, et cetera. So they're going to need more funding. But it just goes to show you the kind of the difference. So, number one, you know, we will always continue to champion greater funding from DEFRA. But from my point of view, I I, I've only just joined this sector. I come from charity and I come from a private sector previously. Uh, we, you know, we also need to look at private sector investment uh, in, in the Cotswolds as well. So we'll, we've got some really lovely contracts and, and partnerships developing with the likes of Seven Trent Water, uh, with the likes of ground control, grounds maintenance, with the like of Thames Water, where we are looking for new sources of funding. So. On the one hand, you know, we'll always look for greater funding from government, but on the other hand, we've, we've got to be more proactive and perhaps to some extent more entrepreneurial as we move mm -hmm. forward. Uh, from what you've said, Andy, um, it sounds to me like your organisation has two distinct sort of areas. One, which is, you know, that sense of dealing with uh, local authorities and other statutory bodies. But equally, I suspect, and looking at your website, you are very much focused on volunteers and people actually getting out there and doing stuff. Um, so... How does that sit with you as the chief exec? Yeah, I, I, you know, one of our one of our key responsibilities and, and, and key reasons why we're here is to do things like writing that management plan in the Cotswolds. But even with you know, twenty three employees or you know fourteen employees as it was, we can't deliver that ourselves. That's a partnership thing. We also provide material such as uh, guidelines on landscape strategy. We also work with local authorities on planning issues. And all those things we have to do and are extremely important. But I made it very clear that when I joined the organization, uh, you know, I come from an operational background. And I, as, as well as doing those things that I've just mentioned, I really, really want our organization to be seen by doing things on the ground, doing things, working with communities and making a real difference on the ground. Uh, yeah. and, and you've mentioned the, the volunteering. We, we've got about 400 voluntary wardens in the Cotswolds. Uh, who, who work with our organisation? I've, I've got a I've got a part time uh, officer that that is is basically the conduit with all those four hundred voluntary wardens, but they do an immense amount of stuff, immense amount, including maintaining the Cotswold Way National Trail, other access and, and footpath and bridleways in, in the Cotswolds, uh, but also in normal years they lead over three hundred guided walks freely for members of the public. Uh, so, so it's it's an absolute. What they do is is unrivaled anywhere in England. I can tell you that. And I think without that, the Cotswolds would be a, a poorer place. So, so they are amazing. So that, that's something that is a real big difference on the ground. We also run a rural skills program. So we give people the opportunity, whether that's school children or people visiting the Cotswolds for a weekend or people looking to start a new career. We run rural skills courses and things like dry stone walling, hedge laying, coppicing, blacksmithing giving people a real experience and not just that but the work they do may well likely be in the Cotswolds countryside for years to come as well whether that's a, a repair to a dry stone wall so so again doing something on the ground really important and I'm as we move forward that that's the real focus for me as, as, as chief executive. Okay sorry about the coffee machine by the way I don't know if you've heard that but no um so you know 2022 is not that far away what's going to be top of your agenda for the next uh, 12 to 18 months? Well, I think for me, um, one of the things we've just we've just um, had a, a new vision for the Cotswolds adopted by our board. Um, our board is 37 board members, but uh, <clears throat> that's a whole other story. Um, so we've just had that. And really, the vision is setting out our store for, for what the Cotswolds could look like in 2040. Uh, acknowledging. And I think one of our big challenges, Mark, is, is, you know, we have to acknowledge there is a climate emergency. We have to acknowledge 
there is an ecological emergency and, and nature is in decline and we need nature to recover. So the vision sets out our store for the fact that we need to be focusing on these things as well as you know, our statutory purposes of conserving and enhancing the landscape and the special qualities. Uh, sometimes, quite honestly, that can cause a conflict where we're trying to fulfill our statutory duties in conserving and enhancing the landscape and, and the reasons the Cotswolds is designated. And on the other hand, we are looking to, to look at solutions for climate change, mm. um, climate mitigation and nature's recovery. And the two aren't always compatible. So that's a real challenge for us. One of the things we've, we've just done recently is to, is to write our own climate crisis commitment. Uh, and, and one of the key things we want to do from that, first of all, the first step in that is to really understand what our carbon baseline is in the Cotswolds. So, so we've got an ambition to, to get to net zero or better by 2050 or sooner. It's a great ambition, but where are we now? What does that journey look like? Is it, is it, is it a huge journey? Is it, is it actually is it, it's a five minute, five minute drive up the road? I don't know yet, and we don't know yet. So, um, so, so that's a piece of work we'll be going through over the next 18 months, and we'll, we'll soon to be recruiting. I talked about recruiting growing. Um, we'll, we'll soon be getting to recruitment for a role called Net Zero Landscape Officer, who's going to do wow. exactly that. So that, that's going to be a really exciting role for us. Um, because lots, lots of local authorities are doing this work in terms of carbon baselining, but in terms of cutting that to the boundary of the Cotswolds National Landscape, we need to be looking at that ourselves as well. So when will that job appear? Because I bet there'll be CPRE members. You might be interested in applying for that one. Well, I, I've got my fingers crossed that funding will be in place by the end of this week, actually, uh, oh, okay. for the role. So yeah. I would say I, I'm very hopeful that by the... Um, you know, by the end of November, early December, that role will be out for recruitment. And it'll be an 18 month fixed term contract, but a really exciting role. Um, sadly, the clock is beating us, Andy, but I've got one question, one or two questions for you, actually. One is, um, how do you actually go about getting your message out there and engaging with the public? Because you cover a vast area. By the sounds of it, you've got a very large remit in terms of responsibilities and ambitions. So, how do you actually go out there engaging members of the public and telling them what you're doing? Because I think, by the sounds of it, there's a lot to be done. There's a, there's a huge amount being done and a, an equal amount to be done. You're right. We, 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 we use all the, you know, the normal channels, our, our, our website, which is cotswoldsaond.org.uk. Um, we, we, we go out for all the, the normal social media channels. Uh, but, but one of the things uh, we are looking to do in the next few months, actually, we've written the survey, is to go out and do a public survey to understand what, how people are currently engaging with the Cotswolds. Something close to my heart, having grown up in Cornwall, which I, I, I always compare with, it's quite, quite neatly to some extent with the Cotswolds in terms of people's perception of Cornwall is Port Isaac and Paul Zeck and St. Ives yeah. and beautiful yeah. places. Growing up in Cornwall, I see Bodmin and Red Roof and Camborne yeah. and St. Austell and areas of significant deprivation where people grew up in Cornwall and haven't even visited the beach before, you know? And, and in the Cotswolds, again, the perception is, is, is money and wealth and all those kind of things. There are villages in the Cotswolds and towns and cities surrounding the Cotswolds, you know, where, where that's definitely not the case. And our challenge, and I don't quite know the answer, but we're working on it, our challenge is how do we reach out to those people so that everybody can enjoy the countryside and it's, it's equal? Because the, these yeah. national parks originally were, were created post-war is a nation's healing for the nation's healing and uh, somewhere along the line uh, you know it's 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 that there is a, a challenge where we need to find out how we get back so that everybody enjoys these spaces not just a few and, and that's that's one of our big challenges Mark. Okay so we'll, we'll look out for those public meetings hopefully and uh, equally uh, your website do you want to give it another plug Andy because yeah, sure. uh, I'm sure you'll get a lot of traffic on it from our members. No. Absolutely. It's cotswoldsaond.org.uk. Uh, and if you go into caring for the Cotswolds, you'll see a bit about the, the, uh, what the work of the voluntary wardens and it'll give a bit of information as to how you can sign up and become a voluntary warden. So, uh, so please do. We need more than 400. <laughs> OK, well, well done and good luck to you. And by the way, do you miss the sea if you're a Cornishman? Well, I do. Probably a little bit, but my, but my wife and kids more than me, actually, because I grew up in Cornwall, whereas I, we, we moved there as a family. We were there for about seven years as a family. So, so I have to say my, the wife and kids probably miss it more than I do, because it was just something that I grew up with. So it was normal to me. I know the feeling. OK, Andy, great to meet you and very best wishes for 2022. Thanks, Mark. Nice to meet you.